thought experiment. Like, okay, we know that the common ancestor of apes, monkeys, tarsies, everything was this. About two inches long, it was an insectivore. He was eating his great big, great big insect there. So what they did is they ran around the forest canopy. They were up, lived up here. They were cute. Yes, they were cute. We were cute once upon a time. <laughs> These are tarsies from Madagascar, the closest we've got. And they were colonial and communal. And they hunted dragonflies, and they ate a lot of leaves, and they, they crave sugary things like berries and sap. So it's a burger, fries, and a shake dog. <laughs> <laughs> the next time you're passing by a fast food stand, it's, it's your insectivore roots talking. <laughs> so I did a thought experiment here, and which is the ball of prosimians in the rainforest canopy all huddled together at night for security and warmth, the communal, communal complex. What if at dawn there was one crazy one? There's always one crazy one in the community, right? They found the Ray to Ions. Uh, uh, she, she positioned herself, I call her overdrive, and, and this will be apparent later why. She, she positioned herself on the outside of the ball such that at dawn, when the sun is just poking over the rainforest, she can gently get herself apart from the community ball because she knows that there's going to be a tree, a, glo a globule of tree sap on the limb. And she's going to go out there and take it for herself. And the tree sap is pure glucose. So as she goes out to it, and she, she looks with one eye to see if she's going to get busted by the community for the community property, uh -huh. right? These things. But she goes and she sees the tree sap, and she purses her lips and puts it on and starts sucking the nutriment in. And she starts getting really high, really <laughs> fast. That's why she's called overdrive. But unbeknownst to her, so there she is, um, headed for that, <laughs> headed for that, uh, that goal. But I'm, I've been asked to her, as the dawn comes, there's a pattern of squares across the, the limb. And they suddenly, they're kind of weird colors, but she can't really see it. Suddenly they shift. This is what's happening. Uh, so you see how you all responded to that? That's deep programming, as well as burger fries and shake cravings. Uh, this was our primary competitor after the Chitlov impact, after the dinosaurs were gone and the big raptor birds and things that ate us when we fell out of the green. These were the number one predator for tens of millions of years. They were laying in wait for us. So she's on, at the limb sucking down her, you know, her elixirs and coming to awareness that there's something strange going ahead and it's the body of the snake and the head is just below her in the striking position. And she either snaps to and understands that this is danger or she snapped off, snapped down. So she snaps too. <laughs> See, we were always very psychedelic. Uh, she goes on and makes her double, and breathes and makes her double. This is where I believe we got visionary. The ability to have vision, the ability to see color with acuity in 3D and do everything else. And it led to this, starting very early, gave us the ability to visualize stuff in our heads, pictures, 3D shapes, scenes, mythos, stories, World of Warcraft, the whole thing. So our brains grew from that core of being able to recognize the patterns of snake scales with high acuity. And so as we got to this stage, and with our epithecus, and we got up to these dudes that look like they need tickets to Burning Man too. <laughs> no one noticed them at Burning Man. Uh, but it all is from this companion. The companion that evolved us, that co evolved us, but it led to this. We could do this because we could see those. So we could make these beautiful mosaics from Herculaneum. And it led us to be able to do this and this. So we were co evolved with the serpent to be able to do all this amazing stuff and drive cars and everything else. But this is the beautiful world that, that we came from. But this is the world we're turning it into. This is near our the lab I used to work for in Pakistan, where there's the old world there, and there's a software office right next to it. But the devastated world of the Indus Valley, which used to be a garden, a Buddha walk from there, is now a completely devastated wasteland with 150 million people. So 
what is going on, let's, let's rewind the clock, let's look deeper. Now we've got a little bit of uh, an evidence for how we were made evolutionarily. What about how we are continuously remade from within? And I think that it's all about those inner space parts. This little guy here, the little inner child that maybe didn't get his needs met back in the day, maybe uh, got injured, ignored, love was conditional. There's, there's a lot of names for these, they create wounds. And there's an enormous body of, of new practice to talk to these inner beings. And that's another thing from Burning Man, this is a, all about Burning Man, this particular talk. So you go from this, a couple that are just not talking, but look at their inner, inner child, their inner parts. This is what the inner parts are doing. So we are more than one person. We're not just the head walking around worried about getting things done. There's all these parts inside. I call it the inner kindergarten. But what is happening on top of all this? The serpent is back and coiling around us. Look at this. How many of you have been caught doing this? Right? So what are we doing when we look at those screens? We are looking at pixel patterns we're mesmerized. And we stop breathing and we become prey animals. So it's the fundamental core process by which we are made is, is forcing us through this immense evolutionary nick. And we become prey animals to what is coming through that screen. And we're not snapped down like a serpent, but we're snapped up by, in a sense, predatory cultural processes that we're all familiar with. Fake news, craziness. All coming, I would say, from core wounded parts within us. So the serpent is us, that is consuming us. So there's a way out past all this. There's someone being consumed by the, by the serpent, it doesn't feel very good. The way out kind of was shown to us way back in the early 1980s by uh, George Lucas. Do you remember this scene? That Darth Vader has been defeated in the great lightsaber battle. There's Luke. Darth says to Luke, Luke, take off this mask, which is uh, Darth's mask, because Darth is Luke's father. And this is what Luke has just discovered. He takes off the mask, and this is what he sees. This very soft, wounded being that has been trapped in, in the mask of empire, in the mask of trauma, all this time. So Star Wars gives us this metaphor for healing across the great divide of the rebels and the empire. Beautifully, beautifully depicted. Inspired by Joseph Campbell. Thank you very much. But these are the cultural memes we're now giving to our, ourselves. So this is uh, actually something that Mikey Siegel was talking here. was doing in Esalen last year. This heart sink. It's kind of a derivative heart map, but it uses the synchronization of people in they're literally hearing each other's heartbeats. In the opposite sense, they're in the sonic environment and they're seeing the heartbeats of the other. And then the system, this fantastic heart sync system, synchronizes the group into a kind of union. And people kind of get high on this. And he brought this up to Burning Man. And uh, people get into a kind of a union. So we're using the serpent of tech to create union experiences. That's what the Trans Tech Conference is all about. You should check it out in November. So you can counteract the serpent with the group, with the group process. So it's really about healing the inner kindergarten first. And what the Dalai Lama may be coming to realize is that it's about not about sitting on the pillow and going spatial in our meditations alone. It's actually kind of a trap. It's kind of a dissociation. It gives us a momentary relief, but it's not the real work. The real work is and all those uncomfortable parts in us that we kind of don't want to go to, you know, like, whoo, wow, that's us. That's how we were made. And they need our attention. So this prepares us, if we can do this work, it prepares us for this connection with the field itself, which can be the synchronous guide to all the things we need to do in the world and a brilliant future in the cosmos. And there was a questioner in the audience last night who was saying, we're not ready to go to space. We're being driven like this. 
idea of returning to the moon is being driven by lots of ego and jobs programs. It's actually the wrong motivation. It's just a really a dumb thing. The dumb plans always come from the Republican administrations, and then the, <laughs> then the Democrats defund the dumb plans, and we're left with no money. So that's that's the NASA story. But there's a better way to do this, which is as we heal ourselves internally, and we make that world that Charles will talk about, the beautiful world we know, our hearts know it's possible, we can do anything. We can really do anything. We can heal the whole planet, of course. <laughs> we can do fun things like this. So this is Von Braun. 1952 with Chesley Bonestell doing this beautiful uh, vision of what our future in space would be. Going to Mars with big tanker ships. All fun stuff. And then of course we have the dream of Stanley Kubrick in 2001 in 1968, but the only thing we've been able to do is build this to scale for six people instead of a Hilton Hotel or a Marriott. This is for, for hundreds of people. This is the only thing we've been able to do. But we have all this new space stuff, you know, and we have the innovation engine going once we are ready as a species. And I think we can get ready simultaneously and do this. So here's his, his starship concept for going to Mars. What I've done for about 20 years is NASA simulation and design work. So here's one of my bigger projects for NASA. I was asked by headquarters in Johnson Space Center to come up with a way to set a spacecraft down on an asteroid, which is really low gravity, get the people out on the tether it down, get the people out onto the surface, and do sampling all over the asteroid. So this is the design I came up with. There's somebody taking a selfie. <laughs> And it was featured all over the news, and it helped shift NASA's direction. So we used this to steer NASA away from another dumb Republican plan toward a defunded Democrat plan. <laughs> but in the meantime, about four or five years ago, these really silly things started happening. These uh, asteroid mining companies, and they didn't have a clue about asteroids and what, how they're made up. And so they had these things on the web. And I work with Peter Janiskins at SETI Institute. He's a meteor astronomer. He was like, this is just nonsense. So they get tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to do nonsense things. It happens a lot in the valley here. You can't do this. You can't bolt buildings and you can't tie a cable around these things because they're, they fall apart. There's boulders on the surface. You can't do this. So my other lifelong dream, I mentioned this morning, my first dream was to understand how life began on the Earth. My second dream was to give it a path into the cosmos. because. We are responsible right now. We are driving the biosphere. The biosphere is no longer self-maintaining in the way it was. It's, it's human responsibility. But the Earth probably has 100 to 200 million years of viability left for plants on land because of the sun heating curve, the Venus Terminator getting close. We're going to flip into Venus conditions, according to James Lovelock. So Gaia is at the edge of the cliff, and we're the last shot. We're the only shot. There aren't going to be spiders driving cars, you know, we've used up all the gas. <laughs> There's no future for the, for the biosphere other than that those more of those microbial mats until the sun eats the planet. So I, I've been working on this since about 1978 and came up with this with the three partners, a way to take a membranous enclosure, a balloon structure up to an asteroid, scan it with 3D, until it gets, you get it safely inside. You just put your enclosure around it, push the enclosure down to close. Closure. This was designed with, by Julian Knott, the greatest balloon designer in the world. Seal it, then introduce a gas, an atmosphere, making a small world. That will stop the tumbling. They're all tumblers. Within 24 hours, a 10,000 ton object, we can stop it, friction in the gas, and then put a driving phase of gas on the surface and steer it like a, like a sailing ship and drive it through space, fire our little engine and keep up, and we can relocate these everywhere. So it was a brilliant idea uh, that came out of nowhere. It was me and Peter talking one day at a conference, like, and he said, it'll never work, you know, and then we had a bowl of clam chowder, and after the bowl of clam chowder, I was like, I figured out how to make it work. <laughs> so what are we doing out there? Why are we doing this? Well, in order to break basically allow the biosphere to extend into space, we need to use the same material as in that little, who's got the little vial that you smelled? So that same material uh, 
is out there still in its trillions of tons, as is water ice, as is nickel and iron. It's all there. It's what we're made of. If we go there and make them into small worlds, we can extend the biosphere. We first go to things that have lots of water, and this is a comet head visited by the Europeans. Here's a wet sort of uh, neo. There's trails and trails of water pouring off some of these objects. Here's something made out of pure nickel and iron. So what we can do is heat the enclosure and sublimate the ice into vapor, just like at Bumpus Hill. And we can then uh, take that vapor and condense it and make fuels and water for people to drink and fuel and radiation shielding, and make big gas stations all over the solar system. We can then use the mon carbonyl gas process to extract nickel and make plate, 3D plate parts in space. It's called electroform. We can do the last beautiful thing, which I really love, is melt this asteroid that contains ice and water and amino acids and everything else and brags and make a globule that is a living biosphere that we can live from in space. One invention. So mission to go to Mars instead of these one-way trips people have been talking about. I don't want to go on a one-way trip anywhere. <laughs> uh, you go out to the snow line, pick up something with a huge amount of ice in it, harvest it, the crew launches from Earth, it picks up its fuels to go down all over Mars, not planned in one place, but many places, and it has its return fuel to go back home, and the Shepard vehicle goes and gets the next load of fuel. Sustainable. Better way to go to Mars. Better architecture. We can build those Stanley Kubrick space stations. We've been making shrimp burgers probably for people living there. Uh, we can build large structures, and this is what Jeff Bezos wants to do uh, at Blue Origin. So it's a much better way, sustainable way to build and stay in space. So human civilization could then expand, and we could become the stewards of a million biospheres, and have billions and billions of us living in these huge structures that should we want to and take the population pressure and the resource pressure off the Earth. And then we'll come to see, just like Edgar Mitchell did, that the original biosphere is the precious one. And then we'll understand intimately in how to maintain and, and, and nurture biospheres and continue the evolution of life in the cosmos. And we'll, we'll take better care of this one because we'll be able to have an overview on it. And we'll, we'll live throughout this whole system. So here's your, your overall architecture. So finishing up here, what we are actually doing is we've gone all the way from four billion years ago from the cycling system that created the origin of life itself, the wet dry cycling. We've come all the way where we're using a another kind of membrane, Vectran, <laughs> from the helium balloon industry to create another world in the same way as, as protocells got their start. But what we are doing is we're allowing the biosphere to make itself. Just like the little prosimian monkey, just like all that stuff. Everything has to double, everything has to reproduce to go on. And we're realizing a key purpose for humanity to enable Gaia to reproduce. Mm -hmm. And thank you for your attention. So I'd ask if you could come to the mic so everyone else can hear you. <laughs>